Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And uh, uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here today. And it's a great honor. Thank you to Leo. Uh, I'll try to be brief because I realize that there are still three talks to go and that will be presented by three nice ladies. So I don't want to, 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 to be, and, and I, I try to be very brief. And what I want to say, just uh, to introduce my talk, is uh, this one is uh, I'm going to, to present to you uh, uh, what are the uh, possible involvements uh, of, uh, of the lung from systemic disease, and that is contrary from what we have learned this morning uh, with uh, the uh, involvement of the systemic involvements from, from lung disease. And uh, I will try to illustrate to uh, when I will conclude my talk how difficult that can be when one uh, really wants to do personalized medicine with what I'm going to present here as a very modest attempt to better understanding the, uh, the involvement of a systemic cirrhosis. So just to start with, uh, uh, what I'm going to, to talk here is uh, something quite remote from what we, can, what we know in, in respiratory medicine that is the uh, uh, the systemic sclerosis. Systemic sclerosis is a autoimmune disorder and uh, that is uh, mainly characterized by excessive fibrosis that takes place in the skin resulting in a uh, tightness of the mouth causing what we can see here the microstomia and also the difficulty for the fingers to be kept widely open a symptom that is best known better known as a sclerodactyly. But systemic sclerosis also uh, involves other organs, including the digestive tract, the kidney, and most of all, the, the, the lung, with the two main uh, um, complications that are lung fibrosis and pulmonary hypertension. But now, the reason why uh, we have been interested in studying the lung involvement in systemic sclerosis has uh, started with uh, this slide showing that when you look back uh, at the last 40 years, you will realize that the main cause of death in patients with systemic sclerosis has dramatically changed. In the early 70s, renal crisis was the first cause of death, and now it has become one of the most negligible cause of death. And quite on the contrary, the lung involvement and mostly the pulmonary fibrosis has now become the main cause of death of in systemic cirrhosis patients. And that is probably because during the last 40 years, um, the pulmonologists have made little progress in the understanding of the underlying mechanism causing the lung fibrosis in those patients. So the rationale for our, uh, our studies is based on three, uh, uh, three facts. First because we know that alveolar inflammation can pave the way to lung fibrosis, so-called the fibrosing alveolitis. Second, we know that nitric oxide can, be, can play a, a quite an important role as a central molecule in, all, in, in, in a majority of inflammatory processes. And third, last but not least, all those cytokines that have been shown to, be, to play an important role in the pathophysiology of uh, uh, systemic sclerosis are also those who are known to be able to induce the synthesis of nitric oxide. So we have started with a very simple idea, that is to, to try to non-invasively monitor alveolar inflammation by simply measuring nitric oxide in the alveoli and by that means, trying to detect as early as possible alveolar inflammation, and by targeting this alveolar inflammation, by treating this alveolar inflammation, hoping that we can be able one day to prevent lung fibrosis. And there again, I think that we, we, we just touch upon the, the idea of personalized medicine, although we know that that will be difficult. But just let me show you three studies that are clinical studies, very simple studies, and then I will conclude my talk with an attempt to, uh, to decipher the mechanism by uh, studying a, an, animal st an animal model, trying, to, trying to, to, to illustrate what I'm going to present now first. So measuring nitric oxide, all 
pulmonologists know how to do that. But what I'm going to present here is measuring the nitric oxide which is present in the distal part of the lung. Either that is alveoli or small bronchi, we don't know. But we know that with this model, we can really decipher the anatomical origin of nitric oxide. And what we have done is simply measuring the alveolar concentration of nitric oxide. So the first study that we, we, we have published quite a number of years ago is a very simple one, it is a cross-sectional study looking at the, uh, at the data from almost 60 patients and measuring pulmonary function test, echocardiogram, and looking at the CT scan, and of course measuring CT, uh, uh, alveolar concentration of nitric oxide. And there we have shown, we have seen that on average, nitric oxide is higher in patients with systemic sclerosis as compared with a uh, age match group con control. And if, we, if you look at those patients with systemic cirrhosis with and without interstitial lung disease, you will see that those with interstitial lung disease will have higher level of nitric oxide. And by doing very simple correlations, we have also seen that the higher the alveolar inflammation, the, the worst will be the, uh, the, the lung function. And conversely, the higher the alveolar concentration, the, the more important will be the lung fibrosis. So my first interim conclusion is that increased alveolar concentration of nitric oxide is somehow related, not very strongly related, but somehow related to the severity of ILD in systemic cirrhosis. And the next step is simply to know whether that will give us some, some practical info information. And uh, we are going to set, and in order to, 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 to address this question, as to whether cutoff levels of CANO can be derived from uh, this measurement. So the second study followed the first one, and it's a very simple one as well. We looked at the c CT scan from those patients and at the level of, of alveolar concentration of nitric oxide. Alveolar concentration of nitric oxide on the left, CT scan on the right, and we simply did the rock curve and we were able to determine the level from which we can say that ILD is very likely to be present when the level of nitric oxide is above a certain point, 10.5 ppb here, and when we can exclude the presence of ILD when the level of nitric oxide is lesser than a certain point, 3.8 ppb here. So, that will not replace the CT scan because CT scan will give us the, the idea, the, the uh, topology of, of, the, of the lung involvement, but yet still, uh, that, that, can be, that can be somehow useful. So the second interim conclusion is that high levels of CINO is compatible with ILD, and of course, by contrast, low level is compatible of the absence of ILD. Now I come to my last uh, uh, clinical study, looking at uh, addressing the question as to whether CINO can predict pulmonary deterioration in scleroderma. Because doing cross-sectional study is fine, but if we can prospectively uh, follow the patients and try to, to predict uh, the, uh, the, 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 the value of uh, a given parameter here at the CINO, that would be better. So the next study is uh, having a group of patients, more than 100 here, and simply measuring the nitric oxide in the alveoli at the entry, and then very patiently follow those patients during three years. And of course, we have recorded the lung function, and we have determined that a, a deterioration of a lung function, total lung capacity, the LCO, more than 10% from baseline, and also the occurrence of death, will be considered as a serious event. And from that, we have, uh, we have been able to determine that, that with a, uh, a threshold of 5.3 ppb, we were able to say that when the occurrence of uh, uh, the deterioration of a lung function is very likely if that is above this level. And of course, that will be unlikely if it is uh, lesser than this level. So now we are left with a tool 
which is, which is uh, ra rather easy to, to, to perform, that might be useful, but still we are obviously totally incapable to make the link between the high levels of nitric oxide and the underlying mechanism of the disease. So in order to address the last, uh, this, late, this last question, well, the inter interim conclusions, you have it. High levels of CINO may predict subsequent lung function deterioration or death in scleroderma. So now to address this last part of my talk, I'm going to present to you this animal model. That is actually, we, we have been able to, to create a model of systemic cirrhosis in, in the mouse simply by injecting the, uh, this compound, which is HOCl, hypochlorous uh, chloride, in, in, in the animals. And our idea here again is, uh, was rather simple. We inject three compounds, bleomycin as a positive control, HOCL as a, uh, as a target uh, drug, and of course PBS is as a, as a negative control. We do that at the entry and every week thereafter. And then we, we have tried to measure nitric oxide in the exhaled air from those animals. And every time we do that, we will then sacrifice the animal in order to get the tissue and all the biological markers to know whether or not this increased level in exhaled nitric oxide is accompanied with some biological changes. And I'm going to present to you the, the, the data now, that, which are still preliminary, but yet uh, worth to be, to be shared. Th that is the model. We, we were able to, to design a, a, a very small cage and by controlling all the parameters, we, are, we were able to measure nitric oxide in those animals. And here you can see that is the, the, the type of signal that we can get from those, uh, those mice. And that is the uh, changes over time of exhaled nitric oxide in the animals injected with bleomycin or with HOCL. As you can see, there is a marked increase and a very early increase in nitric oxide in the exander from those animals uh, suggesting that there is inflammation in the distal part of the lungs of those animals. And that increase was accompanied by an increase in the expression of INOS, the enzyme which is uh, responsible for the uh, uh, synthesis of nitric oxide. And that increase uh, took part in the bronchi and also in the alveoli. Now, if you look at the fibrogenesis, how the lung will react to this inflammation, you will see that there is a delay in the time course. Here, if you look at the collagen content, in the lung from those animals, you will see that nothing happened at two weeks or at four weeks after the, the start of the, of the experiments. But starting from the sixth week <laughs> onwards, you can see that there is some increase in collagen content, and that was accompanied by the increase in fibroblast activation. So what I'm saying here and what I'm showing here is very simple. That is, there is a delay between the inflammation, which occurs almost immediately after the insult, and then the occurrence of the lung fibrosis in those animals. And the idea uh, between that is that simply by looking at this, this molecule, I, and I do hope here that the uh, nitric oxide system with an NO, uh, NO uh, nitric oxide synthase actually is like Frankfurt, it's not Valencia, uh, in terms of airports. So some, so some were quite important in the network that the Professor Alba Agusti has very nicely shown uh, uh, earlier. So by simply measuring nitric oxide in the exhaled air and by suggesting that the, the nitric oxide can play a role in the oxidative stress. That is also concomitant with the increase in inducible nitric oxide synthase. We can, we can then predict the uh, activation of the collagen production and of the activation of fibroblast. So I'm going now to, 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 to uh, reach the final part of my talk. These are the conclusions. The, the, we have already seen those. 
first, increased alveolar concentration of NO is related to the severity of the disease. Second, high levels of alveolar concentration predict the subsequent lung function deterioration or death in those patients. Third, in animal models, increased exhaled nitric oxide occurs very early in the course of the disease, suggesting that the case, that the case may be the same in humans and in patients. And therefore, detecting this inflammation can help us to predict and to prevent the uh, uh, fibrosis of the lung. And that is the, 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 the fourth conclusion. So what I've presented here is a simply a, a very simple idea with the uh, suggestion that inflammation precedes fibroblast, and by using a simple tool measuring nitric oxide and with the help with an animal model, we help that by that maybe we can, we can reach a part of a personalized medicine one day. And I will conclude my talk by acknowledging because all, the, all that work has been done with the help of PhD students and colleagues. And uh, as a conclusion of my talk, here is the, the, the place where I work. That is uh, the, the place where I used to leave the uh, great uh, French mathematician and, and philosopher, Pascal. And I've learned that his, his room now has been transformed and becomes the office of the administrative director of the hospital. One wonder why. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Swan, for being exactly on time. And uh, the discussion is open. Only, only one. <laughs> only two. One. One. <laughs> OK. Only one question. A long time ago, um, and I remember that when we talked yesterday evening, we did some studies in scleroderma and lung fibrosis, and we did bronchoalveolar leverage. I remember that when there was a flare-up of the disease and more fibrosis, then we got eosinophilia. Is, are those eosinophils the cause of alveolar and all like they are being suggested in asthma? Yes, Do you have there, there, are, there are. There are. Is one of the we we did another study uh, with uh, bronchoalveolar leverage and CIA and measure measurement of CINO that I've not presented here, but there are is one of these in 15 patients. So there is a relationship there. Yes, there is. Okay. Sorry, we have only. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, <laughs>